it's the same thing as right here. I'd like to start this uh, panel by introducing our moderator, who probably needs no introduction in this audience, Ron Manderscheid. Uh, Ron serves as the Executive Director of the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental, Developmental Disability Directors. The association represents county and local authorities in Washington, D.C. and provides a national program of technical assistance and support. Concurrently, he is an adjunct professor at the Department of Mental Health, Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, and past president of ACMA, the College for Behavioral Health Leadership. Um, and all of us know Ron from his many years uh, with uh, NIMH and SAMHSA as one of the real data leaders in our field and, and a dear friend to the mental health program. Ron? Okay, good. So let me start where I should start here. Uh, today is a very historic day, obviously. The secretary was here. She announced the regulations for parity, but I want to go and focus on Mrs. Carter and her more than 40 years of working in this field and providing leadership to this field. And I will be so strong as to say we would not have had the parity legislation and we would not have been represented as well as we are in the Affordable Care Act without all the work that Mrs. Carter has done. So I want to give her a rousing round. Now on to other things. Yesterday, we heard that you need to have a major role in your own sexual fantasy. Today, we want to tell you that a big part of your sexual fantasy is what you think about the Affordable Care Act. So, um, okay. So, sir, this panel is about service delivery. Very, very, very important. So, the Affordable Care Act is not only about do we get insurance and do we get access to care, but also about what care we get access to. I think the triple aim summarizes some of the major opportunities and dilemmas regarding services. First, improve population health. You heard about that in the last panel. Improved population health is not only about clinical interventions and disease prevention and health promotion at the clinical level, it's also about community interventions and population level interventions. And one of the challenges for behavioral health care will be learning how to become a public health discipline. Improve quality health care. You heard about this yesterday also. You heard that we need to rework our service delivery system and we need to build health homes that are operated by accountable care organizations. Very important work. Correlates of that would include prevention measures, performance measures, pay for performance, and so on. We want to get into some of these topics. And then finally, reduce cost. If we actually move upstream and we do prevention and promotion better and we get involved in population and community work and we improve the quality of our delivery system, we should over time be able to reduce costs for care. You also heard about the essential health benefit here. And I want to reiterate a couple of points from that. The essential health benefit must include mental health and substance use disorders and they must be included at parity. That's a major, major change for us. And that's not only for people covered through the marketplace and the Medicaid expansion, that's also for the entire individual and small group market beginning on January 1st. D disease prevention and health promotion are also major features of this. We've never had that really before in behavioral health care, and there's a huge challenge for us of developing disease prevention and health promotion interventions for our populations. Service organization will change from separate specialty organizations to integrated health homes and medical homes. That has been a challenge for us. I would say we went through generation one of integration, which was about treat, refer, Generation two of integration is what we call bi-directional integration, where we put a behavioral health unit with a primary care unit, 
or a primary care unit with a behavioral health unit. I would argue generation three is full bore services integration and full bore financial integration with very good performance measures for behavioral health. The reasons for this are obvious. We have a tragedy of the 25 years of premature mortality in behavioral health care. There's also tragedy the other way. If you don't treat behavioral health conditions and chronic health conditions, fester and become much worse, basically. Service quality assessments are going to assume much more importance. And this is a huge area for development for us. We need to have decent performance measures to put on the table as we move into paper performance and case rates and capitation rates and so on. So huge issues here. We're going to move to an insurance model for substance abuse. That has not been true in the past. Most of the care for substance abuse has been paid for from the substance abuse block grant. And what we paid for is very acute care. We haven't paid for the upstream care that would prevent people from becoming acute. And finally, we need to move into public health approaches, as I said, and I think there's just huge opportunities of moving into these public health approaches. So let me introduce the panel here. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Helen Burston, who is the Senior Vice President for Performance Measures at the National Quality Forum. And for each of our speakers, there's a much more detailed resume in the handouts. Our second speaker is going to be Dr. Michael Barr, who is the Senior Vice President of the Division of Medical Practice in the American College of Physicians. Our third speaker, Dr. Tom McClellan, who is the CEO and co-founder of the Treatment Research Institute. And then finally, Sandro Galea, Dr. Sandro Galea, who is the Gelman Professor and Chair of the Department of Epidemiology at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. So, Helen, the floor is yours here, and we'll see if we, there you go. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you, Ron. I had the pleasure of working with Ron when I was at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and we worked um, with Dr. Satcher on some of the initial mental health work. Really just exciting to see how far I think we've come. What I'd like to talk about today is really putting the perspective specifically around quality, and um, what I was asked to talk about was how do we look at performance measurement differently um, in behavioral and mental health in this era of health reform. So again, uh, Ron's already pointed out the triple aim. I do think it's very helpful um, as we begin this dialogue to think about the national quality strategy that the Secretary had promulgated. Um, and, and, and what is so special about this is it really gives us a sense of true north, of this is what we really want to measure. These are the things that, that if we actually collectively worked on, we think we could make meaningful improvements that would move the needle on healthcare quality in the United States built on the triple aim of better care, affordable care, healthy people, and communities. Um, really a very, very different approach than we have had traditionally in the healthcare quality space, which has been much more focused on technical outcomes, technical processes. So I think this broad breadth approach, including very important outcomes around health and well-being, uh, as well as person and family-centered care, patient safety, communication and coordination, and affordable care, puts us on a very different trajectory, I would argue, around performance measurement and the way we would assess the outcomes of our work than I think we've had in the past. Um, and again, as, as Ron also just pointed out, this is a somewhat busy slide, but just to make the case visually that as you think about what's happening currently in terms of payment reform, there is such a shift currently in the way payment is, uh, is, is being proposed through um, the Affordable Care Act and many other mechanisms to move us towards the side of global payment, shared savings, medical home. And what that would logically do is move you to a more broadly defined performance <coughs> goals, um, population-based payment, and also higher degrees of, of aggregation of providers in a way that we've not had it before, moving us away from the classic um, uh, uh, fee-for-service fee models that we've had to date. Um, and just building on that, this is again a slide just to give you a visual of this, the further we can move towards more of that payment bundling on the y-axis 
and the ability to move further out on the x-axis towards greater degrees of integration, integrated delivery system, it makes those kinds of measures around outcomes and care coordination far more feasible than they have been before. We've always argued it's difficult to measure the connectivity between primary care and mental health, for example, between a hospital and a behavioral health center, because we have not had the ability to, to connect those. That broader systems thinking, I think, gives us a very, very different perspective um, on where we could go in terms of measurement. And a very high level view of this, as I reflect on you know, my years in performance measurement, we've seen a real shift and evolution uh, in the way people have been looking at performance measurement. And I think this has been more so on the non-behavioral health, mental health side, but I think there's an opportunity to think differently as well about creating and moving towards new measures on the behavioral health, substance abuse, and mental health side as well. I think particularly in the clinical care side, there was, a, there, there was an emphasis on very basic processes, clinical processes of care, if X, do Y, that were assumed to be the standard of care. I think there is now a thirst for measures that really reflect higher levels of performance, optimal performance. If a patient has X, make sure you do all the things they need that will collectively ensure that they have a good outcome, rather than one at a time, what we sometimes refer to as composite measures. We also want to move away from measures that are so silo-based. We may have a measure for a hospital, a measure for a clinic, a measure for a physician, or a nursing home, or a substance abuse facility, and yet they are not aligned in any way. So I think increasingly we're trying to think about where is the most appropriate place to measure it, capture that information, and share it, rather than asking each and every time. Um, I had a personal experience about five years ago when my father passed away. Uh, I was in the hospital before he passed away and um, was very, very ill and I was uh, very tempted as the, as the daughter doctor to grab the blood pressure cuff because he just didn't look good. And uh, the nurse came running in and I was so pleased to see her and her question was, you know, Mr. Burston, have you had a pneumococcal vaccine? And I just remember thinking, wrong place, wrong time, he is so incredibly ill, could you focus on taking care of him? And of course, since um, I work in performance measurement. I wanted to crawl under the bed um, as this happened. But this is, a, I think, an opportunity for us as we build that infrastructure of data to really move away from asking it every single time to ensure we get it and really be able to share that information over time. I think the data structure and the information should also allow us to increasingly measure disparities in all we do. It has always been an afterthought. I was, when, when, when I was at AHRQ, I led the first National Healthcare Disparities Report, where we took all the quality measures and stratified them. We can increasingly now do this as a routine part of, of our work, and I think that should be increasingly built into what we do. We also have to begin thinking about measures that reflect what we sometimes refer to as shared accountability or shared responsibility. Meaning, if, if we continue to just look at what I am uniquely accountable for when I see patients on Mondays, I will lose sight of what is the broader view for the patient. So, for example, issues of readmissions or hospital and community-based costs are the kinds of things we'll only get to if we agree to share that accountability, share that responsibility. Um, just as an example, the readmissions penalty program currently, uh, you know, many of, the many of the hospitalized patients have coexisting behavioral health and mental health issues. If they're discharged from the hospital and go back into a community for which they can't get the services they need, that hospital is going to wind up with a higher readmission rate. It's a huge opportunity, I think, for there to be real cooperation and collaboration between those different settings of care. And then finally, I think if you really think thought in a more patient-centered way, patient-focused way across how they would view their episodes of care, you would move towards more outcome measures, including patient-reported outcomes, as I'll talk about in a moment, measures of appropriateness, did, did, did this patient really need this service or medication? Um, and you'd also move towards coupling those cost measures with quality measures to really get a better sense of value. Um, we've moved at the National Quality Forum to having a much stronger preference for outcomes. As measures come forward, we really will only accept process measures, for example, if there's a very strong evidence that that process measure will directly influence and improve that outcome. We're really done with just measurement for the sake of measurement. We've seen a lot of measurement fatigue out there on the part of clinicians and providers. And I think if people have measures that they view as meaningful, 
that they can actually use as part of their practice to improve care, I think you'll have a whole different dynamic and hopefully a much more parsimonious set of measures. So we have increasingly tried to move towards outcomes that are linked to processes and really only those processes if they're strongly linked to outcomes. A very important shift, but also much more difficult to do um, as we recognize. And just a few words about patient-reported outcomes, which I thought was an especially important piece of this puzzle around mental health and behavioral health. And essentially what we mean there is really getting from the voice of the patient or the person in the case of somebody who's disabled and doesn't view themselves as ill perhaps, what's the status of their health condition directly coming with them without us interpreting it, really allowing them to share with us um, uh, their current status of health care. And there are a growing number of these tools out there and um, uh, you know, uh, there's a a depression tool I'm sure many of you know called the PHQ-9, which assesses somebody's degree of depression um, and whether they're improving over time. So really excellent service through the NIH called PROMIS, P-R-O-M-I-S, which allows you to see these very, very short forms to get at fatigue, anxiety, depression, physical health, that I think really add to the fuller picture of what's happening in terms of somebody's care. Um, and there's a growing number of these under development. We don't yet know how best to aggregate these in terms of performance measurement, but it's a really important item, I think, for us to keep an eye on as we build towards the, the set of measures that we want in this space. Um, and just visually, this conceptual model from the patient's point of view, much of what we have focused on in terms of our measurement to date is that blue box, the evaluation and management. A clinical episode begins, they come forward to us, and here's where we begin measuring. And we frequently don't do much in terms of follow-up outcomes, like their functional status or behaviors or symptoms or experience. And we also don't do much around the green box of really understanding patients at risk and the population at risk and prevention. I think it creates just a very different mindset for us in terms of moving forward with measurement. And I think as we think even more broadly about the scope of future measurement, this is from uh, my old stomping ground in Boston at Partners, uh, their conceptualization of we really want to get to outcomes defined by the patient and their families over time and then costs similarly across those episodes to really begin understanding value, value for patients, value for their families um, to get and uh, really understanding the cost of delivering optimal health outcomes. Just a couple last words about uh, moving to electronic health records, and this was brought up during the last panel. Um, in some ways, as we build towards having resources we've not had before, we should not be trying to create measures based on flawed data like claims data um, or even trying to you know, extract things from the paper chart. Really think prospectively about what needs to be in the electronic health record to serve your needs to measure and improve the care for your patients. We need to have measures that take advantage of those data, whether it's through clinical registries or patient self-report, patient portals or electronic records. And we need to increasingly get to that interoperability we've all talked about a lot for you know, a long time of being able to look across uh, settings and providers. So for example, the age-old question about primary care and mental health and that connectivity. Um, we're really pleased we just got a, a, some new work from HHS to Health and Human Services to specifically look at the connection between uh, the clinical settings, both medical and behavioral in the community, and the community, and even begin assessing how you might make some of those connections um, to, for example, state-based data, community-based data that would be really important for clinicians to understand and bi-directionally. Um, and again, the ability to bring in other important data like patient demographics and costs will also give us a very different sense of this. But we know the current electronic health records don't, don't cut it yet. But I think there's an opportunity for this community to really work with the vendors, work with folks as they're moving forward to the better products and say, if you're going to create an electronic health record that's going to capture substance abuse or mental health, these are the data elements I've got to have captured in a way that's structured so we can actually measure it and improve it, because otherwise it'll just be lots of data that we can't actually mine or use for improvement. So I think there's just a huge opportunity for us, and in some ways not having as many measures may be to your advantage, because you can kind of start fresh and think about where you can get to measures rather than you know, much of the more medical fields which have been so heavily oriented to claims-based process measures that haven't really added much value. Um, and certainly, uh, again, think about what that trajectory might be to get some of those more complex data elements put into electronic health records. Can those patient portals feed into your electronic health record so you get information directly from the family and the patient as you're seeing them and uh, working through their clinical conditions? 
So actually, this is my last slide. Um, my father actually had found this quote for me before he passed away that was attributed to Einstein, which I think uh, sums up where we are very well, which is that not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. And I think that's kind of where we are in measurement at the moment, particularly measurement that will drive improvement, not measurement just for the sake of counting things, but measurement that's meaningful to patients, meaningful to their families, and meaningful to clinicians and others to actually drive improvement. And that's sort of countered by Deming's quote about we can't improve what we don't measure. Uh, interestingly enough, it turns out it actually was an Albert Einstein. Um, it was a philosopher, an English philosopher who had said it, but it was hanging in Albert Einstein's office, and I, I'm sticking with it. It feels like something Albert Einstein probably would have said. So um, with that, I will stop and turn it back over to Ron. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. It's an honor and privilege to be here, let alone the opportunity to speak before you to talk about health delivery service. And Mrs. Carter, I just want to say that you inspire all of us to try and match your perseverance, energy, and drive to improve health care. So thank you for all that you do. Just a little more than three years ago, uh, John Bartlett and I co-chaired the Health Education Summit here at the Carter Center. And, and the one and a half day meeting brought together experts from a variety of different fields and professions um, institutions and settings, and some of whom are actually here in this meeting, like Nancy Rudenauer from the last, pa last panel. Our goal was to ask these folks to help us design the future health education model to train future health professionals, to, to respond to some of the challenges we're all, we've all been talking about today. And what we did in advance of the meeting was they asked them to submit some ideas and comments and, and thoughts so that we can start to synthesize you know, something that we can understand and talk about the meeting, but then the goal would be at the meeting to reverse engineer. So describe the future and reverse engineer as to what do we need to do to start training our health professionals now to get ready for that, that future. So uh, this is a pretty dense slide, but if you will, they came up with the idea that the future health system should be a person-centered, whole person-oriented healthcare system that is built upon a foundation of team-based primary care, integrated with behavioral health, mental health, wellness, and prevention. They said the system should improve health for individuals and populations as well as the communities in which they live. That the system would manage complexity through information systems, that this is very interesting, that are self-correcting, uh, yet flexible, uh, and shared among, I don't think we have this now, by the way, shared among healthcare professionals, patients, and so on. That we, it would facilitate seamless care that, would admit, that was administered simply, efficiently, and effective by, while being based on clinical science, but while being grounded in evidence takes into account the needs of the patients and the preferences of the patients, so it's not cookie cutter medicine. And that we would use technology um, to lead to new, new novel uses of computers, perhaps even to replace some of the care-based systems we have now. They also said that the high, this high-performing, equitable, and safe model of healthcare operates within a well-designed network of providers supported by a payment model that aligns incentives, promotes collaboration, and creates value for each member of the healthcare team, and most importantly, the person, family, trying to manage his or her health. So it's a very inclusive and very ambitious model. Simple, right? You could probably try and simplify a little bit by, by using this equation. Economists and those of you familiar with all the challenges of balancing access, cost, and quality have seen something like this. So what we really want to do is improve access, improve quality, and drive down costs, and that's part of the triple aim in the national quality strategy that Helen mentioned. It's part of the desired future. Now, I live my, my life working for the American College of Physicians and healthcare professionals. Obviously, the vast majority are physicians. And so I talk to a lot of different groups about what it is to change practice to meet some of these ideals. And these are some of the things you might come up with in terms of strategies, or, or I should say more likely tactics. You know, the advice lines, the telephone, email, access. You want to try and improve access a variety of different ways. We're experimenting with patient portals and telehealth and telemedicine. For quality, we really want to get to team-based integrated care that, that improves the experiences of everybody involved. And I, from my perspective, that includes the healthcare team, the professionals, not just the patients and their families and caregivers. Uh, and then we deal with cultural linguistic challenges. We focus on transitions, and as Helen was driving, you know, outcomes, health quality. And for cost, we need to use the evidence base. We also need to practice high-value care. What are those things that we're doing that we don't need to do, that the evidence doesn't support, that we can eliminate, that actually in some cases harms people? What can we get rid of? Uh, somebody referenced that yesterday in terms of some treatment protocols for addiction and substance abuse. 
and then we need to continue to improve by research and doing the research to tell us what, what we're doing right, what we're not doing right, what can be improved, and that will help us get to the desired future, which would be better quality, lower cost, healthier people, healthier populations, and happier people, happier clinical teams. But when I talk to uh, physicians, um, they get a different picture, okay? Um, these are good concepts, uh, but if I talk to them, they, 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 we're not really communicating them in a, a coherent, mutually enforced, logical, co convenient way of them understanding it. And so they, they think of this as lots of very small carrots and big sticks. And it, they don't want to hear it, they don't want to see it, they don't want to talk about it. And these are just some of the things, and, and into the, this context is what we're trying to drive lots of change. We're trying to get them to change their practices while they're dealing with things like the, the, the list of items you have on this, this screen here. So they have bad choices, and Woody Allen once said, we're at a crossroads. One road leads to hopelessness and despair, the other leads to total extinction. <laughs> Let us pray that we choose wisely. I mean, this is, this is what some of our doctors feel like. And, you know, should they retire? Should they change their practice? Should they sell their practice? There really aren't a lot of good options. And just as in this audience, you usually get to chuckle. And then everything else after, after that, I, I say to them, is less, less serious. Less, it doesn't seem as bad. It's sort of like when I counsel patients, my anxious patients, patients that need to go for a sur surgeon or procedure, I tell them, you don't have anything to worry about. His right eye is still 20-20 even though he doesn't have a left eye, and his tremble goes away when he holds the scalpel, so don't worry, you'll be in good hands. <laughs> and then they laugh, and then we can talk about the actual procedure. But if we're really going to tackle some of the challenges, we need to have strategies and tactics. And Sun Tzu once wrote, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. Okay? Think about that. So we have some strategies. Um, my good friend Helen, who grew up around the corner from me in Brooklyn, Yes. Uh, New York. Uh, talked about the national quality strategy, and, and here's the triple aim in a little bit slightly off kilter diagram when it got converted. But you know, we want to reduce the per capita costs, improve the health of populations, improve the experience of care. So this, along with the national quality strategy, reforms a lot of, informs a lot of what you see in terms of the agendas and the initiatives. So what are some of the tactics? Yes, that worked. Okay. So we have the medical home, patient-centered medical home, patient-centered medical home neighborhood integrated with mental health and behavioral health, hopefully supported by robust health information technology that doesn't get in the way of care but fosters care, along the lines that Helen was describing, with payment models that anchor this model, these models, into the culture and sustain them, which means changing the culture from what we do now, which somebody said yesterday was sort of we have a sick-based health care instead of a health care-based health care system, and then part of larger models, the so-called accountable care models. You'll hear accountable care organizations. I like to refer to them as models because they're very different. They all have the same sort of concept, and I'll describe that in a moment or two. Now, how many of you are familiar with the patient-centered medical home? It's been mentioned a few times. Okay, so uh, being from the ACP, I'm going to give you the physician-centric way of looking at it. The joint principles of the patient-centered medical home were, were released in 2007. Um, and this was after a lot of work by the pediatricians in the 1960s around the medical home. We came together with the family physicians, the osteopathic association, um, and the pediatricians and came up with a patient-centered medical home. It talks about having a personal physician, but in a team-oriented practice. And the first thing folks do when I present this to physicians, at least when I started presenting it, is I can't have all those folks in my practice. No, you don't. We have to have the relationships, the firm relationships, the interactions, the seamless integration with all these professionals to meet the needs of the patients and populations that we see. That's the critical part. And that we take that whole person orientation, that we coordinate care, break down the silos, we address quality and safety because if we do it, all this and we don't improve quality and improve safety, we're not doing what we need to do. Talk about access is actually the primary goal. If you look at some of the Commonwealth studies, if you improve access, some of the health disparities start to melt away just by getting good access to good quality care. And then payment to support this. Accountable care organizations, essentially, it sounds like most of you are very familiar with this, but, but this is sort of, there was a lot of confusion between accountable care organizations and medical homes originally. You know, are accountable care organizations the medical homes? Are medical homes really necessary? The point I would like to make is medical homes, medical neighbors, health homes, whatever you choose to call them, I don't particularly care, they're the foundation of whatever you're talking about in terms of new health care delivery systems, integrated with mental health and behavioral health. Without well-designed primary care, primary health care, you can't have all these accountable care models. It just doesn't work. 
So if you break it down to the level of the practice, though, what we're looking at is a very well-trained physician, clinician. Again, I'm the AC physicians at Comerica College of Physicians, but this could just say nurse practitioner, physician assistant, in an organized practice to deliver excellent care. These are all critical components of the same model. We're going to zoom in on the organized practice a bit. So at the center of this should be the patient family caregiver. We need to redesign back to the culture, back to the change, back to the Woody Allen quote. This is what some of our practices are struggling with. Refocus on who we're supposed to be taking care of, the patient family, in a well-organized practice concept driven by the medical home ideas. Now, a relatively newer concept is the, the medical home neighborhood. So in other words, the interactions, the connections between all those other healthcare delivery components that patients have to go through, but right now they're not really doing it in a well-integrated, seamless way. We're not sharing information, the right care is not being provided to the right person at the right time. The neighborhood concept is a facilitating that bi-directional communication, co-management, the idea that if we have a patient, I have a share a patient with a rheumatologist or the nephrologist, we, the patient, the patient's family know what's going on, who needs to be, get contacted when, what laboratory tests are going to be done, who's integrating the care for this, who's managing the care for this component. And then we have to also have to recognize, as many of you have said and we've discussed, that folks see the doctors or the clinicians very small percentage of their lifetime. They live in communities, and we have to look at the socioeconomic determinants of health. And we, as medical home doctors and physicians, need to be thinking about how we can change the environment in which the patients live. And then you put that into the infrastructure, which could be an accountable care model, it could be uh, an integrated delivery system, or so on. What we really want to do is move from today to tomorrow, I won't go through all these because I just got the five minute mark, but we want to go from taking care of patients who come to see me to those who call me their clinician, the population I serve, from a chief complaint to a systematic assessment of patient needs and so on and so forth, so that we're anticipating care, that we're projecting what we need to do for the patient, with the patient and his or her family or caregiver, and with those we call our neighbors in terms of the clinical health system. So back to the Carter Center Health Education Summit in 2010, we came up with five, five different prescriptions. And I want to talk each about real quickly. Teaching context. A quote from the, the report. The cumulative actions and decisions of healthcare providers in the service of patients ultimately determine the quality, cost, and outcomes of our health system. So while there are externally imposed requirements that may add little value and may drive up cost, it's still our personal and professional obligation to be knowledgeable about the demographic, socioeconomic, financial, quality, political and cultural issues that are driving healthcare services, and to do everything we can to advance us towards the triple aim and the national quality strategy. With regard to teamwork, clinicians will need to work as high-functioning interprofessional teams, or should work in high-functioning interprofessional teams, rather than as a collection of specialized individuals. And while the Health Education Summit was targeted at trainees, we need to figure out how to teach existing practices in healthcare systems to practice as teams. Integration, this is specific to making sure that we do what has been described in terms of integrating mental health, behavioral health, into primary care with wellness and prevention. That is, you, many of you know the data much better than I do, but that is an imperative. Resources. Uh, the paper called for investing new resources in the training environment, um, but we need to acknowledge that without innovative approaches to teaching current practices and health systems how to adopt these models, it's going to be a long time before we see happen into healthcare the way we want it. So we need to do that. And finally, we need to measure the results, and, and uh, Helen did a great job of looking at sort of the future of measurements, and I think that's where we need to go. We need to start thinking about in the last panel, we talked about claims-based measures in the health information exchange. I actually think it has to be a combination of clinical and claims data. We need to be looking at what did the clinician or clinical team do in response to data that was presented in the electronic health record. The between the ears thinking, the, the lo logic, moving forward on that to make sure that treatment was escalated when it needed to be done, not just what was the value at a certain point in time. So in short, what we need to tell everybody is to plan for change. And uh, you can be cynical about change, as George Carlin was. He put a dollar in a change machine, nothing changed. <laughs> and you can look for things that are getting in the way that, that prevent you. And I, I would then say, point you to this Hasidic saying from the 18th century, just as the hand held before the eye can hide the tallest mountain, so can the routine of everyday life can keep us from seeing the vast radiance and secret wonders that fill the world. So to my clinician colleagues, when we start to wonder about all these things on those earlier slides getting in the way, we need to look past it, look at the, the true aim, where we need to move. 
And of course, you must be the change you want to see in the world. And I ask you to say, what are you going to do in response to these day, this day and a half when you get back to try and change the systems in which you live? Because the power to change is here in this room. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. That was a great uh, segue. And uh, thank you, Mrs. Carter, and to all of you. Um, I guess I'm the representative for the uh, substance abuse side or uh, substance use disorder side. And I want to talk a little bit less about specific measures and specific items that we ought to be paying attention to and more about the concepts behind all of it. Because honestly, at least in the substance abuse side, I think we got it wrong for about 40 years. And if we take the promise and the opportunity to become integrated into the Affordable Care Act as an opportunity to keep doing, finally get a chance to do what we've been doing for the last 40 years, it's going to be a missed opportunity. So I, I want to see if we can think a little bit about it. And in the substance abuse field, the addiction field, it's always been considered a bad habit. It is a very, very recent phenomenon that we've even been in the same conversation with the rest of healthcare. This has been very clearly a criminal justice issue. Um, substance use has always been considered the product of poor morality, bad parenting, poor self-control, things like that. And we've had a beautifully simple model to uh, address it. I think of it as a washing machine model, actually. You take a dirty old substance user and you put them into Shady Acres treatment program. Now you notice that program there has nice clear boundaries that corresponds to the 30 days or the 12 sessions or whatever. It's also not part of the rest of healthcare. It is, it's special special in that it, uh, it's sited someplace on the other side of the railroad tracks, okay? Um, anyway, you, you give 30 days in, uh, of treatment and the expectation quite clearly is there's going to be an insight. The patient will have learned his lesson. They will get it. Um, and then we will, and at the bottom line there is, uh, that's where the graduation ceremony occurs. Everybody's hugging, everybody's crying, best of luck, Billy, you know, good. and then they are referred to church basements. Now, <laughs> six, six months or 12 months thereafter, to find out whether this has worked, guys like me, who've made a career of this, have asked patients, are you still sober? If, if they are sober, hooray, treatment works. That's good. Mostly, they're not sober. The relapse rates are very similar to the relapse rates in untreated diabetes, hypertension, or asthma. 50% six months, okay? And it has left the public very skeptical about treatment. The average duration of treatment in a substance abuse treatment program is one day. Outpatient, five days in a residential uh, facility. And the assumptions are very clear. We've always thought there is some fixed amount of time or stuff that if we jam it into these poor guys' heads, they'll, they'll get it, okay? Um, if every clinician knows something for sure, and they're probably right, although the evidence for it has really been, been bad, that if you just match the right kind of stuff with the right type of patient, you'd get better outcomes. And um, evaluation has always occurred as you might evaluate the, the results of a cast for a broken leg. It's always occurred following um, uh, the completion of care, six months, 12 months usually, and poor outcome means failure. By the way, it's never, evaluation has never been a clinical activity. It's never been reimbursed, never been considered. It's always been, it's made me a living. That's what I do for a living. Well. That's not the way most other treatments work and, and most of the uh, chronic illnesses. And they're very different. Um, the symptoms of an incipient chronic illness are usually detected in primary care because doctors, nurses, clinical team has been trained, 
educated to do it, because they've been reimbursed to do it, and because they have tools, medications, interventions that are also reimbursed to, 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 uh, to address it. Uh, so the incentives are all there. Now, you know, lots of times primary care for hypertension will work just like that, and the problem will be arrested. Often it does not. And, and when it does not, um, that's when you get referred to specialty care. Um, here, there's no cure, and there's never been a pretense. Cure, it's why it's called a chronic illness. You, you might want to write that down. And, uh, but the goals are quite different. There, specialty care is supposed to educate the patient, reduce the, the uh, acuity of the symptoms, educate the family if possible, and then what? Refer to church basements? That, you know, near as I can tell, they don't have 30-day diabetes programs. They don't have graduation ceremonies. That would be malpractice. No, instead, you go back to the primary care doc. And the reason is, you, you don't have a cure, you never pretended to have a cure. The goal is to have good management. Now, you're all, you're all saying to yourself, Jesus, you, 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 this guy was asked here to tell us this, we, we knew this. Well, you know what? We didn't know it. And it, it, it affects the way we have been seeing results for a very long time, I, I wanted to sort of bring that to your, to your attention. I'll, I'll skip some of this. It makes a difference. The way we've considered substance use has always been as an acute illness, something that needs to be remedied, okay? And that's not the way we've thought of others. So here's a real world example that you paid a lot of money for. Um, I'm gonna talk about two studies that are remarkably similar in method but very different in concept. The first is one of the largest studies ever done by the National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse called Project Match. Very simple concept. Three conceptually different treatments for alcoholism. Let's randomly assign patients to get these three different treatments, and I'll bet you one's better than the other, and I'll bet you that certain kinds, and we pre-specify this, certain kinds of alcoholics will do best in particular program A, but not B or C. It was $27 million, some of the best groups in the substance abuse field uh, worked on this, and the goal was lasting abstinence. Very appropriate, that's what we've always looked for. And there on the left are the three treatments. Motivational enhancement therapy, which was the short-term treatment in that it had four sessions. The long-term treatments were cognitive behavioral and 12-step oriented treatments, very different conceptually. They were 12 sessions long. And patients were randomly assigned, and we were supposed to see different outcomes for different kinds of pre-specified patients. Well, we didn't. There were no significant matches. Oh boy, that was a, that that stung. Um, everybody was abstinent at the start of treatment because they were recruited right out of uh, usually residential care. But by six months, only 45 percent were abstinent, and there were no significant differences across the three. By, uh, uh, by 18 months, it was only 38 percent, and out at 36 months, only 27 percent of patients were still abstinent. This was a big black eye for NIAAA, quote, waste of government funds. I'm not trying to rub any uh, salt in any wounds here. What I find so interesting is while this study was going on, quite literally down the street, was a great success also done by the NIH. Antihypertensive lipid lowering treatment to prevent heart attack, all had. What I find so interesting about this is it's the same question. It's a different disease, and the disease has different expectations. Here, there were three quite different and quite different cost uh, kinds of care. Uh, the diuretic, the calcium channel blocker, and the, at that point, relatively new ACE inhibitor. The goal was to achieve blood pressure control. Now, in the addiction field, we ain't never had none of these fancy measures of disease <laughs> control. They do. It's called blood pressure. 
They're very easy. It's quick. 140, at that time it was 140 over 90, now it's 130 over 80. So notice the similarity of the design here. You have three different uh, treatments, patients who left uh, primary care, m m most of whom were referred, they were all referred from primary care, only about 27% were, were received, were, were, had met blood pressure control at the time they were uh, assigned. They randomly assigned, and they really also thought certain kinds of patients were going to do better with certain kind, a particular kind of uh, medication. Well, um, they didn't find it. But nobody got all upset about it because they went from 27% of patients who, during the course of their treatment, were blood had reached blood pressure control to 45, 42%. Now, if this had been an addiction study, they would have stopped it and just kept or, or actually gotten rid of everybody on a medication and, and kept studying it. Well, they didn't because the goal here was to try to find that combination of things that would achieve blood pressure control. So for those who did not achieve it by six months, they re-randomized them and now they got two medications. It went to 55%. Anybody at 12 months that had not achieved blood pressure control got the third medication, and it went to 64%. So quite literally, at the same time the NIAAA was hanging its head in shame and failing to see project any, any matches, the, the uh, NHLBI was waving a flag of victory at not having seen any matches, but having achieved a strategy for, for bringing improvement to patients. And what I, I'd like to show you is that that concept under which at least the substance abuse, I don't know how much mental health has been laboring under this, but, but it's, it's hurt us. And so, all right, wise guy, you, 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 you've trashed the, the uh, addiction treatment system. What do you think would work? Well, I know what would work because I have seen it. Uh, it's an interesting thing in the substance abuse field that there's one set of patients who do not get the same kind of care that everybody else gets. Actually, two. Airline pilots and doctors. If you're either of those, you don't get just quant quantitatively better kind of care. You get qualitatively different kind of care. It starts if you have, if one of your colleagues smells alcohol in your breath every noon, or you've made a mistake with a patient more and more, and, or there's missing uh, Dilaudid or something, you are referred to the physician health plan. All but two states have a physician health plan. They do not provide treatment, physician health plans. They manage it. And what they do is they first step is to get a full and complete diagnosis of you, and when they find that you have a substance use problem, you're offered a choice. Most doctors, not all, most doctors say, you know what, maybe I should. Your choice is go into the uh, addiction treatment program, and it's a five-year program, or you are liable for any charges that may be brought against you as a function of the, your substance use. If you go into the, the, uh, the treatment program, you're held, uh, all that's held in abeyance. Um, it's got three phases. I'm going to go quickly. First, you get evaluated. The, the second phase is really acute care treatment, which is what all of you would get, what m m my family gets, uh, in treatment. It's about 30 to 60 days of residential care. That is followed by um, about six more to nine more months of outpatient care during which you can resume practice. But throughout the whole thing and for four years thereafter, you are monitored continuously. You get a urine test on a regular schedule uh, and you may get monitored by somebody from the physician health plan who will show up at your office and say, hey, let's go have a cup of coffee and please fill this little cup, okay? And you know what? It works. It works by any measure you want to take. You want to say, does it preserve jobs? Yes, it does. Does it re produce abstinence? Yes, it does. 
Um, I'll go through this in the sake of for the sake of time. But throughout a five-year monitoring period, 78% of physicians and airline pilots never give a positive urine. That's not at the end of five years there's a urine taken and 78% are positive. I mean throughout the entire five-year period. And I know what you're thinking. Of course I do. I'm a psychologist. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> thinking these, these guys are gods. They, they, anything would work. Why? It's not fair to hold the same standards. No, that's not so. We've evaluated hundreds of physicians and airplane pilots and lawyers who get exactly the same kind of care that you or I would get, and they have exactly the same uh, relapse rates, and they have exactly the same antecedent causes for those relapses. So um, I, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to conclude by saying, as we move into the, the uh, real potential for the first time of really integrating substance use services and mental health services into the rest of healthcare. I'd like to just point out two things. One, let's get the right model. Let's get sensible measures. And two, let's remember something else. It's not a gift to the mental health and substance abuse field. It's not, we're not being given something just because it's fair, just because it's our time, or just because there's a democratic administration. You can't run the rest of health care if you don't manage substance use and, and mental health. In the substance abuse field, it is $120 billion of wasted general health care expenses. Not my figures. These are OMB and CBO uh, dollars. So I hope that's been helpful at a conceptual level. and. Um, turn it over to the next speaker. Good, um, good morning. I want to thank the uh, Carter Center for inviting me. As uh, someone who's been a um, lifelong uh, deep admirer of uh, Mrs. Carter's advocacy in the area, it's really an honor to be here presenting, particularly when we had a uh, historic announcement by uh, uh, Secretary Sebelius. So I'm here from a slightly different perspective, I think, than uh, most other speakers. I uh, come to you from a uh, school of public health, and uh, my charge is not to talk about treatment, not talk about curative care, not talk about uh, service systems, but to talk about populations. So what I'm going to try to do in these 15 minutes is discuss why it is that we should think about mental health in populations in communities. And implicit in everything I say, and I'm going to come back to this at the end, the reason why I think what I'm saying actually matters is because when you think about populations, you can think about prevention. So I am here to make a case for population mental health, and part of that is make a case for efforts to prevent mental illness. So having said that, let me plunge in. I'm going to take this approach. I have, uh, I'm going to talk about taking a population approach to mental health, and I'm going to try to address three questions. First, I'm going to try to address should we take a population approach to mental health, then I'm going to move, to, can we afford not to? And then I'm going to move, so having said that, can we? So let me move to the first question. So should we take a population approach to mental health? And I'm going to take three points of reference to try to help address this question. And the first point of reference is intuition. Now I think for people in this room, there are many, many ways in which your intuition can help you get to the point I'm going to make. But I'm going to use geography to make this point about intuition. And I'll start with this. This is a map of the United States. This is 2008, uh, for which, the most recent uh, year for which we have data. And the states are shaded in the darker for the greater prevalence of depression. So Louisiana had three times the rates of depression than did North Dakota. Now that's the country. Let me now move to one city. This is where I live. This is New York City. The Upper West Side and Morningside Heights, which are neighborhoods separated by about a mile, there's about a two-fold difference in depression between these two neighborhoods. Now, somebody might say, well, it's depression. Depression is particularly sensitive to social conditions, so let's not look at depression. Let's look at autism. So there's autism in the United States in 2010, again, same schema, and two states adjacent, Minnesota and Iowa, there is a tenfold difference in autism between those two states. Now, why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this 
because using geography as a tool to help sharpen our intuition, I think you'd all agree that it is very difficult to make a case that there is a deep genetic or individual difference between Minnesotans and Iowans, or between those from Louisiana, I don't know how you say that, and uh, North Dakotans. But when you think of it this way, it becomes pretty clear that there might be differences in communities, in populations, that are driving these differences. So that's a point about intuition just on geography that might suggest that there is something to populations and to population mental health. Now let's move to values. I, I, I think uh, if we are asking the question, should we uh, consider population approach to mental health, it is fair to say, well, does that fit in with our values? We are here, we're talking a lot about treatment, talking a lot about cure, all of which is undeniably centrally important. But let me ask you this question. Ask yourself this. Would you prefer to have access to effective treatment for your schizophrenia or never to have schizophrenia at all? I think it's a question that we can all answer relatively easily. And I think uh, this is, I, I, I'm, I, I in no way mean to make light of a very complicated issue, but uh, I'm highlighting this because I think this quote captures well what I'm trying to get at. This is uh, from uh, a couple of the smartest people I know in public health who wrote that one of our most difficult challenges is to ensure that the urgent does not crowd out the important. In health, the urgent, the challenge is difficult because urgent matters can be so riveting. I think in health, broadly, physical health, mental health, we think a lot about what is urgent. And urgent is my illness. Urgent is my depression. Urgent is my fracture. Urgent is my heart attack. But the argument here is that it is important beyond the urgent to think about populations and potentially think about prevention. And the third point I want to make on this, trying to answer the question of should we take a population approach to mental health, is I wanted to show you a bit of a formalism. And I want to show you why when you think about populations, it is unavoidable that we should be thinking about populations in context of mental health. So I'm going to use the schema. These uh, little people um, are uh, people in the population. And because this is the Carter <coughs> Center, everybody's blue. So this is, a, uh, <laughs> this is the population. Um, and how do, we, how do we typically think about providing curative services? How do we go about doing that? Well, the way we go about doing that is we are very good at identifying factors that make people at high risk. And one can think of it as substance use, you can think of depression, you can think of it as psychotic disorders. There are things that, in my language, we call it exposures. You can call it whatever you want. There are factors that make people at high risk. So let's say, for example, trauma. You get exposed to trauma, we know you're at higher risk for anxiety disorders and depression, depressive disorders. So let's say that the people over here, the red people, are the ones who have been exposed to whatever it is, to that risk factor, okay? Now, we are going to have some people that's the green, who develop disorder. But notice that some people develop disorder both in the reds and in the blues. And what ends up happening in almost all conditions, be they physical illness, be they mental illness, is that because there are more people who are unexposed, more blue, even if the rate in the blue is lower than the rate in the red, you have as many greens in the blues as you have in the reds. Which means that if we focus only on the high-risk folks, these people over here, and I'm going to come back to this point, we are missing a substantial burden of disorder. That the only way to actually capture the burden of disorder to provide curative services to those who will need them is to think of whole populations. So, my first question, should we take a population approach to mental health? And I would argue that the answer here is unequivocally yes. Now, I'll move on to the second question, which is perhaps a harder question, which is, okay, maybe we should, but maybe we don't want to. You know, we should, but we don't want to because we have different societal prerogatives. So the question is, can we afford not to take a population approach to mental health? And I'm going to answer this by going back to my formalism. And uh, if, uh, if I had my druthers, I would actually lean reflexively on the math that, with which I'm comfortable. But uh, I'm, I'm here going to try to show this again, going back to my population. Our curative efforts are always definitionally fixing a very small part of a much larger challenge. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to go back to my population. This is the population, the population of blue people I showed you before. And I'm showing you now some people who are exposed. So the green people are exposed to something that makes them at risk, okay? So let us say, for example, that the green is a traumatic event. So you have a population and some people are exposed to a traumatic event, right? Makes them at high risk and let's say for depression. Now, if we follow this population forward in time, what happens? 
Well, some people are going to get disease, and disease here I'm marking with an X. Now, the key fact here is that not everybody who is green has an X. You see that there are some greens without Xs. And similarly, there are some blues with Xs. So just because people are at high risk doesn't mean they're all going to get disease. And just because you're at low risk does not mean you will not get disease. Now, why is this relevant? Well, how does this get us to this question of can we afford not to take a population health approach? Well, this is relevant because this maps on to what a curative individual-based medical approach does all the time. So let me just map this on now to this curve. At the bottom here, I have the risk factor, let's say trauma. And on the y-axis, I have number of people. And with every risk factor in our life, there are most of us who are somewhere in the middle. There are some who are at extreme on the far right, some who are at extreme on the far left, right? What do we do when we think only of individuals? Well, what we do all the time is we come up with a cutoff. And we say over a certain amount of exposure, with one trauma or two traumas, whatever it is, to the right, we say you're at high risk, and we try to treat you, right? That's what we do. That is our entire biomedical system, be it for mental health, be it for physical health. Taking this and mapping it back onto these, this population, what the medical strategy does is it's taking care of all the green people with or without access. But what it's missing is all the blue people with access. So unless one looks at whole populations, you are going to not even touch these blue people with X's. So taking this back to my paradigm using the curve, back to my risk spectrum and my prevalence, what a whole population approach does is it takes that curve and instead of truncating it, it moves it. It moves it to the left. It says, how can we change the risk factor of the whole population so that we move the whole population to the left? And what does that do? Going back here, instead of doing what it was doing before, which is selecting people to, to uh, focus on, what we are doing now is we are reducing the number of greens overall. And in reducing number of greens overall, you reduce number of excess and number of people with disease. So the point of this formalism, and I, uh, this is a lot of little people, I realize that is, that, is that a focus on, if you don't focus on populations, we are inevitably, inevitably going to miss people with disorder. And it's only by focusing on whole populations that we can truly reduce the prevalence of mental health overall. So the answer to this question in my mind is, can we afford to try not to take a population approach to mental health? I think the answer there is no. So I'll move to my third question, which is, okay, having said that, having made an argument that we should take a population approach to mental health, having made an argument that we can't really afford not to. Well, the harder, perhaps the hardest question of all is, well, having said that, can we? Um, and I'm not sure exactly how to answer this question, so I, I thought I would do what, what I do when I don't know how to answer something, which is start with a story. Um, uh, so there's a story. A 47-year-old man is felled by something. He's a very active, highly engaged man in a very busy profession and he's felt by an illness. Really nobody under, can understand it. He can't seem to get moving anymore. Can't really seem to do anything anymore. His doctor suspects something, but they're not really sure because it seems like it's something that everybody else has. And uh, so they don't know what to do. So what do they recommend? Well, they do what doctors like me do all the time when you don't know what to do, which is say, you know, rest, hope for the best. Maybe take a couple of aspirin. Um, um, I mean, how familiar does that sound to many of you? How familiar does that sound to very active people who encounter some mental illness that we don't really understand and are treatment of, right? Now, this is a real story, but it happened in 1955. Anybody know who it happened to? This is President Johnson before he was president. Lyndon Baines Johnson, 1955, at the age of 47, had a heart attack. At a time when actually the presentation of a heart attack was completely not understood. Doctors suspected a cause. What cause did they suspect? They suspected smoking. But everybody smoked, so how could that possibly be a cause of his disease? And what was the treatment he got? Essentially nothing. Essentially sort of you know, hope for the best that was the treatment at the time. Why am I going to, to, uh, to heart disease? And actually, the talk preceding mine was a perfect setup to this. Um, because I actually think the question of can we prevent heart disease in 1955 was as fuzzy and unclear 
in our minds, as is the question today, can we prevent mental illness? And, and, and the rubric of my talk is that, well, we're still not going to unless we accept that we should. We're still not going to unless we realize that we should think of populations, that we cannot afford not to, and maybe we can if we apply our collective brains to it. This is uh, showing you from uh, one of the classic experiments in the world where they showed they could uh, reduce the prevalence of heart disease in whole populations. This was actually done in Finland, and I'm showing you their shifts in cholesterol in whole populations. It can be done. When I talk sometimes in, in my role as a chair of an epidemiology department, I get asked to speak to um, chronic disease groups, and I talk about um, taking provocative, radical approaches to thinking about how we can further prevent things like heart disease, and I suggest things like this. Let's just ban all escalators. Not elevators, they're still elevators. Just ban escalators. Do we really need escalators to go up one or two flights of stairs? Um, and when I say this to cardiovascular disease groups, they take it very seriously because they are thinking, they are forward thinking in how one might go about preventing cardiovascular disease. And I think in much of medicine and in much of pop in public health, there is a greater awareness of the centrality of prevention and population health approaches, but it's something that, that has been hard to come by in this field, in the field of mental health. This is from an Institute of Medicine report, came out in 2012, um, particularly around the US health reform. It's no longer sufficient to expect that reform in medical care delivery system alone will improve the public's health. Large proportions of the US disease burden are ultimately preventable. So going back to my third question, so can we take a population approach to mental health? And the answer, I think, is yes. I'm not exactly sure how, but I think it is. So I just want to end with, um, go back to where I started, which, as I said, I uh, come to you from uh, a uh, school of public health. I am a physician by training, but also uh, um, um, I spend my academic life within uh, population health science. Um, public health ultimately is what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions for people to be healthy. And if we are going to think about populations, we are thinking about societal conditions that promote health. And in much the same breath, we are thinking about societal conditions that we can manipulate to prevent illness. Prevention ultimately is the act of stopping something from happening or arising. And I sort of I'm going back here to the old saw, ounce of prevention is uh, worth a pound of cure. And I think it's an approach that it is high time that we incorporate within our broader mental health agenda. I think in a time, in this exciting, exciting time of the changes that are coming about with the ACA, um, with a lot of provisions in there about how health systems now have greater responsibility for communities around them, it really is the time to affect an inflection in the trajectory of how we think about mental health in this, uh, in this country for the sake of improving the health of populations. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. Very nice. <clears throat> Isn't that a super panel? Give them another hand here. Yes, absolutely. Okay, the first question for Tom. How much consideration is given to substance use disorder as a result of self-ridiculing men a mental illness when determining treatment? Medicating, sorry. I, could, one more time. How much consideration is given to substance use disorder as a result of self-medicating a mental illness when determining treatment? Well, I, I freely confess I don't know the answer to that question. Um, the, the risk factors for uh, addiction, now remember that use, abuse, and addiction are, are not the same. Addiction is not simply a lot of use. Uh, but addiction is now uh, best considered a chronic illness. It has about the same genetic uh, uh, penetration and, and risk factors as other chronic illnesses um, and affects about the same number of people as uh, diabetes in this country. Uh, and I am hedging and uh, fumbling about here because I, I, don't, I don't know. If, if you're asking is addiction some kind of uh, response to an unmedicated illness, I honestly, this will probably annoy people, I think that's an antiquated idea. It is as, uh, I think it's a disease sui generis. It, it is a disease unto itself. Um, yes, indeed, people who have other 
subs other uh, mental and physical disorders also have it. And people with addiction also have other chronic pain and other illnesses, but I think it'd be too facile to imagine that a, a, a significant proportion of uh, diagnosed addiction is merely the result of an unmedicated, untreated um, mental illness. Good, good. So for Helen, uh, where, if anywhere, have standards or criteria for consultation and engagement of consumer patients in defining outcomes been established? So you made a lot of comments about consumer-oriented measures, and obviously in this field we're very interested in that. Yeah, it's a great question. We did some work last year, and I'd be happy to share the link with the folks to share with all of you on patient report outcomes where we had uh, tried to come up with a set of criteria from a patient's perspective. And, you know, many of them were that it was actually meaningful to the patient, um, and also from a patient and a clinician perspective that it was actionable. If you actually had that information, it was meaningful and you could actually act on it, as well as the fact that there were tools that were reliable and valid, so you weren't just measuring things that, that were not appropriate. We'd be delighted to share that report, but it, it, it's a very important question as we look towards going down a path of developing some pretty complex measures. Michael wants to say something. Got two microphones here. Um, uh, related, but not exactly to the measurement, there's a growing movement towards collecting patient-generated health data directly into electronic health records, and there's an activity being funded by the Office of the National Coordinator through the National eHealth Collaborative, of which I'm privileged to be part of, where we're working with patient engagement strategies and, and others and experts trying to identify what is it, that, that set of data, that we can be collecting on a routine basis that could help inform future measures, but being collected you know, asynchronously, not necessarily at the point of care, but on an ongoing basis, uh, treatment success, uh, barriers to care, all those types of things that can help inform whether we're doing the right things. Okay. Anybody else want to comment? Okay, so uh, very important issue here for everybody. What are some of the key steps for all of you? What are some of the key steps or first steps we need to take from behavioral health care to move ahead the issues you described? All the way, Helen, from you on moving these person-oriented performance measures to Sandro to moving population-based health. Um, happy to start. Uh, certainly, I think a lot of the work that's already been done by the, the blueprint by SAMHSA and others of thinking through what are the most important, highly prioritized areas, I think is a really first and important first step. I think a second part of this is really beginning to get our arms around collectively the infrastructure of where that data would come from and actually working at the same time you're trying to think through where the guidelines would suggest a, a measure might exist, how would we ultimately think about building that data infrastructure to actually achieve that? As far as changing practices to get to the point where we have the, the integration, I think as I tried to share, I think there's a lot of stuff going on at the level of the practice and a lot of distraction. Not all of it is pointing in the right direction. So I think there has to be perhaps a bit of resetting of priorities. And we're trying to get practices and health systems to do lots of different things and not all of them are aligned in the directions that we'd like to. So to some degree, part of that is as a consequence of uh, uh, regulation to trying to move forward, for example, health information technology into practice, which is good. We should be doing that. But some along the way, some of the objectives and some of the not necessarily the objective, some of the strategies to try and move it, the requirements are distracting from some better models of healthcare. So we need to think about how we can redesign what's already being trying to be designed to get it to do better. So that's not a great answer, but I think the medical and medical model give us the foundation to do some of the things we need to do. Okay. Uh, well, I, I know much less about other um, mental illnesses, so again, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to stick to the uh, substance use disorder. So I, I would say two things. Uh, there are 164 medical schools in the United States. To my knowledge, three have a course in substance use disorders. It's a now an essential healthcare practice. So first, let's educate nurses, doctors, pharmacists in substance use disorders. Second, um, the reason substance use disorders are in healthcare and reason it's essential is because it was discovered in the course of, of this that so much of medicine, so much of other chronic illness is adversely affected by lower level substance, not just addiction, har harmful medical use. So I think we need very rapidly to have 
paradigms, protocols, interventions that will show value in the larger areas of health, in diabetes, asthma, chronic pain, all the other areas. When we show value, and and because uh, we're the new kid, in, uh, substance use is the new kid in into the game. Uh, I think we'll have more respect and and uh, uh, better results. Excellent. I um I um. I feel like I'm coming at this from the wilderness. Um, uh, there are uh, 164 schools of medicine, as you said. There are 40 schools of public health in the country. Um, um, fewer than a handful of them have any uh, real engagement with mental health. And conversely, mental health organizations, uh, fewer than hardly any of them actually have any engagement with prevention and population health right. thinking. So it was the first step. I actually think this kind of conversation is the first step. And uh, accepting that it, this is something that should be done, accepting that's something that we cannot afford not to do, is some, accepting that it's something we can do. Yeah. Excellent. Another kind of related question, uh, one of the areas that HHS is moving into is work on the social and physical determinants of health. And this moves upstream and it gets you into population health, it gets you into very different measures and so on. And I think it's very important, and the question implies it's very important that behavioral health become engaged in this. How can we in, pub, in behavioral health actually become better engaged in the work on the social and physical determinants of health? Anybody? Well, let me, um, I'll, I'll try to tackle that since uh, it's from an academic disciplinary home point of view, it's roughly where I exist. Um, um, I, I think um, if, if you accept that populations matter, you have to accept that social and physical drivers matter because if something is driving the health of populations, it has to be outside the individual. And what's outside the individual is the social and physical environment. We use a lot the term, how does the social environment, physical environment get under the skin? And if you, one thinks about a lot of conversation here today, a lot of what we talk about is about under the skin, which means disease in me. So in, in some respects, that goes part and parcel with accepting the notion that populations matter. I think the... Um, the, the positive about recognizing that social physical drivers have a place is that many of them are malleable. That if you accept that social driver ma matters, social isolation, if you accept that social isolation is one of the biggest drivers of depression in this country today, which it is, social isolation is malleable. When's the last time we've he heard of anybody within the health industry talk about social isolation interventions? We don't do that. We should. Please. I'll, I'll pick up on that and just to follow one of the uh, themes of the last panel about the uh, role of the uh, peer uh, supports. Peer supports have always been considered, at least in the substance abuse field, as something one does after somebody gets treatment to sort of protect the investment. Very good idea. But, but as you just point, point out, uh, we can predict an awful lot of who is going to get substance use and many other mental illnesses. Uh, peer support efforts and um, efforts to, to restructure the environment, to reduce the, the toxic stresses, to improve the early childhood development um, is going to do a hell of a lot more than detoxification uh, efforts, I'll tell you that. Excellent, thank you. So uh, a question on integration and again, you know, we're moving from the second to the third generation of integration between mental health, substance use, and primary care. This is kind of a related question. In doing that, are we abandoning other systems that we need to continue to work with, such as criminal justice, child welfare, social services, and so on? And if so or if not, what should we be doing about it? Anybody? Do you want to take that one? Well, let me say a few words yeah, about it. It sounds like your topic. <laughs> Obviously, uh, these systems are very, very important, first as a source of identifying new enrollees for insurance in the Affordable Care Act. So obviously, yes, we should be working with the criminal justice system, the child welfare system, the social welfare system, and so on, but also, to go to Sandra's point, if we're going to take a, a broader population approach, we need to be reaching out more broadly than the people who we see under the street light here. And there's a huge opportunity going forward, and I think the best example of this in the U.S. that I'm aware of is the work being done in Oregon 
where they have created community care organizations that include mental health, substance use, primary care, dental services, and public health. They've gone farther than anybody else in these arenas, and I think, you know, there are lessons to be learned by all of us here. Another question here, um, as we move to integration, I think the worry is the same as occurred in the panel yesterday afternoon. How are we going to train our providers, our peer supporters, our consumers to work with these integrated systems? Huge issue here for us, I think maybe the biggest issue that has come out in this symposium. Well, I'm not really sure how many of my members, and ACP has 137,000 members of which 70 something percent are in practice, are really aware of the kinds of models that, we, that all of you are familiar with. So I think to your point earlier, education is a, a key part. Now, we'll do our part, but you have to do your part. There are still not enough of these kinds of conversations have, ha happening. So I think that's the first step because, it, you know, if we can solve some problems for patients, people, their families, but also at the same time solve some of the issues in terms of the challenges of practice because the patients we're talking about are very challenging to take care of and everybody knows that, but we don't do a good job of it. If we can figure out how to solve that and, and show the value of the better systems, I think we'll see it be up, uh, taken up a little better. And just one more comment, uh, less from a mental health perspective, a, a broader policy level. The shift towards greater integration and bundled payments and accountable care organizations means there's actually sort of a C-suite executive sort of financial view that this needs to work in a way that perhaps we haven't had it quite as much sure. before. So if that's helpful and that's motivating, that at the end of this we should achieve better outcomes at lower costs, then perhaps that'll actually help support what probably was the lack of an infrastructure for anybody to even understand how integration would happen. Excellent. So then uh, a question for each of you. So first for Helen, how can behavioral health get on board with these broader performance measures here? Uh, your organization does wonderful work. If you go and look at what's going on in performance measures in D.C., there's just incredible complexity everywhere in HHS and in the agencies and so on, how can we move that agenda in a positive way and, I guess, reduce the complexity? I think that's a, that, that, that's a great question. So we're actually actively engaged in a behavioral health project right now, have another one that will begin by, the, by next summer. So at least there is a huge interest in looking towards new measures of mental health and behavioral health services. Um, I have to tell you, many of the measures we're currently reviewing that have already been around for a while are some of those very basic process measures that people don't have a lot of faith will be actionable and meaningful. So I think there's an opportunity for the mental health community, particularly this integration piece, I think is a huge opportunity to think about the connectivity and the sharing of information and even some perhaps structural approaches to look at quality. Um, and again, we'd be delighted to engage with the community and think about how to actually move from point A to point B in terms of the, the more patient-centered outcomes. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so to Michael, you made a point of talking about consumers and primary care providers having different visions of the care system. How are we going to begin to bridge that? I made that point. No, just <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I did. Um, you know, I think there are different. I think the, the health system, as currently designed, doesn't do a great job of understanding the perspective of the patients and the people who come to see us. And so, I think there's the opportunity. You know, in a busy practice, I just did a little bit. A little. I mean, over 50 percent of the visits, or 60 percent of visits, are 15 minutes or less. So the opportunity to understand all the dynamics that are driving people and patients and, and what's going on is so small. And physicians have traditionally been taught it's their job to do everything. And that clearly is not a satisfactory way of going about doing the right thing. So broadening the team, sort of the team-based practice we talked about, or I mentioned earlier, the interprofessional idea, and relying upon others to help collect that information, share it with the clinical team, but also encouraging that kind of, of interaction between patients, families, and the practices. One simple example we try to get practices to look at is having a, what we call an advisory team or advisory committee, having people who are in their practice come and help advise them what's happening in the community, what are you as a practice doing, not doing appropriately, what can we help you improve, and share data about the performance so we can continue to improve. Excellent, excellent. Tom, for you, uh, do you believe that work in the ACOs will succeed clinically and financially without appropriately addressing 
substance use issues? Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, they, uh, they asked uh, Mark Twain if he believed in baptism. And he said, believe in it. Hell, I've seen it done. <laughs> and in this case, I have to say, I've I, I seen it done. Um, I'm seeing <clears throat> integration occur and make a lot of difference uh, in, in odd places. One of the places I would least have expected it was is the breast cancer uh, uh, unit in, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. They um, had no interest in anything associated with alcohol or drug abuse. Why would they? they hadn't been trained, you know, it's, uh, that's psychiatry's work and all that. We integrated, we, we showed them the value of screening and brief intervention. They, they resisted it fervently. Um, what turned them around was one, a lot of research showing that alcohol accelerates tumor growth. Uh, and, and, uh, alcohol is a good predictor of whether you get breast cancer, and if you have it, it accelerates tumor growth in any amount. But they still were scared because they were afraid, if you start asking these women questions about their, their lifestyles, oh my God, you're going to get them all worried, and, and th nope, that wasn't the case either. These women wanted every single opportunity they could to, to uh, have effective treatment. It made these cancer doctors really look good to give them that extra piece. So we added value, and uh, they charge more for it. Uh, the nurses have special credentials now that they didn't have. The women feel better cared for. But it's, it's that that's going to do it. It's not that it's the right thing or, you know, any of that. It's, somebody's got to show value. Excellent. Okay, Sandro, uh, back to the same issue again. How are we going to move behavioral health toward public health in a practical way here? And we do have some steps we've taken in this field. For example, we have a, a fairly strong set of people who do good population epidemiology. We have a strong uh, section in the American Public Health Association that represents mental health. There's another section that represents ATOD. But obviously, that's not bridging far enough here. Uh, can you help us take the next step in some way? I don't know. Let me offer one, just one, one more thought. Um, uh, I was pretty depressed when I saw the slide earlier that the, um, was it the oldest uh, specialty is psychiatry, second only to preventive medicine. I thought this is not boding well. Um, uh, <laughs> we're, like, <laughs> we're like killing all the people who are taking us in the right direction. Um, uh, the, um, I, um, I suppose I, I, I tend to ascribe uh, tremendous value to the, uh, to the public conversation. And uh, I think... Um, Fora like this one can set the agenda, can establish a vocabulary that the nation can follow and change the course of events. So do I have something practical? I, I think um, if, if we, and by we I mean the collective broad we, those interested in, um, in reducing the burden of mental illness in this country, uh, make a push to push more to the forefront the notion of populations and preventing mental illness, I think things will change in much the same way as things change over many decades of advocacy. On a negative side, you can say, well, it takes decades of advocacy to have the secretary saying what she said today. On the positive side is, well, she said it. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, I, I prefer to look at the glass half full. Yeah, excellent. Let's give them a wonderful hand. All hard questions. So we are ready to, I guess, adjourn for lunch here. Afternoon. Um, I'm Lee Ellingson, the Associate Director of the Mental Health Program. I'd like to thank the panel again. And if Dr. Bartlett looks, doesn't look like Tom Bryant, I look even less like Tom Bryant, but I had 14 wonderful years of working with him, so I will try to channel him as I uh, release you to your working groups. Um, you guys can go ahead and sit down if you'd like. <laughs> Um, again, like yesterday, we're going to dismiss you from the f with the group that's traveling furthest. You will notice that the lunches are set outside your working groups. Please don't steal everybody in the chapel working groups lunches out here and walk through the, uh, through the center with them. Really, I promise there are lunches where you're going. 
Okay, um, <clears throat> the group that was in the cafe, it's now in the Cypress Room. That's been cleared from dinner, so you don't have to travel quite so far. Working groups end at three, so you know, try to start wrapping up at 2.45. We'll reconvene here for the summation at uh, 3.10. So take your belongings with you, because the group here doesn't want to have to trip over your stuff. Okay, well let's start with group number three, going to the Cypress Room. We have uh, leaving from the same door that we had last time. You guys get bonus points. I hope you have your pedometers on. All right, I think group three has started heading in the general direction of the Cypress Room. The second group is group one. You're gonna be in the rotunda. Please exit out this back door. There's a, a lovely gentleman hang, holding up a sign. All right, it looks like they're heading in their general direction. Group two. Group two has been meeting in the Zabin room. And then group four, you're staying here in the chapel. Please go out and get your lunches and bring them back in here for the working groups. <laughs> 